Welcome to these presentations from Family History Month 2023 in Wellington, brought to you by the combined Greater Wellington NZSG branches, Hutt Valley, Colburnie, Poirua and Wellington. Okay, welcome to the fourth and final uh, Family History Month presentation. My name is Helene Philpot and I'm the convener of Hutt Valley branches. Our speakers this evening are Jason Murphy and Kelly Dix. Jason Murphy works in the digital experience team at the National Library, one of several teams contributing to papers past. As service manager, Jason has the task of shaping the design and de development of the website with the help of a highly engaged community of users. We will hear Jason's best tips for exploring the site. Kelly Dix is online engagement manager in the digital experience team at the National Library. She manages the digital nz.org website and seeks out new audiences through public presentations, social media, and a range of other outreach activities. Kelly will demonstrate how to create family history stories in digital NZ using content from heritage organizations alongside your own photographs and digital items, digitized items. Welcome, Jason and Kelly. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. So my name's Jason Murphy. Thank you very much for coming along tonight to hear about uh, Papers Past and Digital New Zealand. Uh, so as you've heard, I am a service manager for Papers Past, um, fairly new-ish service manager. Um, and what I'd like to talk to you about tonight is, I'm going to give you a little introduction uh, to Papers Past for some of you who may be less familiar with it or maybe haven't seen it for a while. Um, but then we're going to dive into the site itself, um, looking at how you can find family history information in papers past. I'm mostly going to focus on the newspaper collection, both for the purposes of time, and that's where much of the, the value lies for family history research. Um, and then I want to share with you at the end a feature that we've been working on, which is user text corrections. Um, and I'm going to give you a little preview of where we've got to uh, with that. Okay, so... Papers Past, what is it? I imagine many of you will be familiar with it. Um, so Papers Past is a website um, and a service managed by the National Library. And I think we're most well known as being a, a place you can access digitized New Zealand newspapers, uh, particularly older New Zealand newspapers. Um, but that's just part of the story, of course. So now we have also some Pacific content in there. So we have newspapers from Samoa and Cook Islands. Um, and we also have these other collections as well. So just to give, certainly newspapers are the largest collection still. So to give you a sense of the scale, uh, we have about 7.6 million digitized pages of newspapers, and then you can add another million or so on top of that with these other collections. So five collections in total. Um, we have newspapers, magazines and journals, letters and diaries, parliamentary papers and books. And though we'll be focusing on newspapers, um, I would encourage you to take a look at the other collections. And I'd say for starters, have a look at magazines and journals and parliamentary papers, just in terms of general value for family history research. But that's not to say that you couldn't find things uh, in all of those collections, depending on your ancestry. Okay, so... Um, Given these millions and millions of pages, I guess the challenge is pulling the needle out of the haystack, so to speak. So uh, let's dive into the website itself. And I'll look at uh, a bit of an orientation for how you go about browsing the site and also then searching the site. So like any website you'll tend to encounter these days, those are the two approaches. You can kind of browse, poke around, or you can start searching across the whole thing. And we'll look at both approaches and when you might want to use them. So... Yes, technology is working. Okay, so here we are with the Papers Past website. I'll just take you back to the homepage so you can see how we actually get in there. So you can see we have each collection here, these uh, images and tiles. I'm just gonna click into newspapers here. Okay, so when would you want to browse the collection? So browsing's often useful when you have quite specific dates, so, or maybe an era, area where you expect to see something. So let's say you have a particular event, you know exactly when it happened, and, and perhaps you want to get a perspective on it from the local newspapers at the time. 
you might have birth information and so you want to see perhaps if uh, there's a birth notice for a publication around that time um, or it can be an instance where maybe you've been trying to search but you're pretty sure that something should be in that particular paper so you just want to dive in and see for yourself um, and maybe you can find it that way in any case you'll have your own reasons but let's have a look at how you can um, browse so we're looking at this explore section at the top of the page here so you can go on by title region or year it's going to take you through the same list it's just going to arrange it slightly differently so we'll go on by title so what's going on here so i'm getting a a whole list of all of the newspapers we have. We've got 183 titles now. They span back to 1839 with New Zealand's first published newspaper, the New Zealand Gazette, uh, all the way through now to 1989 with Christchurch's The Press. So it's been a recent edition this year. Um, you can filter in a variety of ways. You can filter down to the New Paper Māori collection. So these are all publications which are in Te Reo Māori or bilingual. Um, we'll keep it broad for now, but what we can do is say do it by region and seeing we're in Wellington tonight, um, I'll narrow it down to Wellington. Okay, so you can see here if we were interested in the Dominion, for example, we can see the title here that's a link that will take us into the paper, it confirms the region it comes from and this, these, this is the span of digitization. So we've digitized from 1907 to 1934 so it's, it pays to look in um, this list to, to make sure that what you're looking for, we, we can sort of match the range for the digitizations. There may be some gaps in here. This just tells you the span of the digitization, uh, the beginning and the end. So let's go into the Dominion. Okay, so you'll get a little essay here, a bit of background about the Dominion. Well, what we're really looking for is dates. So you've got a drop down of all of the available dates here. So I'll take an example, we'll go 1919. And you get month by month what's available. So all of these green squares are very good news because on those days we have a digitized issue of that paper. So I'll choose April Fool's Day. Why not? We go in there and here we are, 1st of April 1919. So a couple of ways of moving around here. So you have all the contents to the issue. So um, each article is listed in order as a link here. You, you may be interested in birth and deaths, for example, here, and we can click directly into those. The other option is if you want that experience of browsing through a newspaper is kind of as close you, as you can get with a digital version, you can click on these smaller images here. So if we do that, you see you've got the scan of the newspaper, you can use these links here next page to just go through, flick through the newspaper. Now this is not particularly re readable, so you want to use the enlarged image that if you do want to settle on a page. And also if you hover over uh, any of these articles and you're interested in those, you can just click through to zoom in on that article and here we are so at this point i'll just um, share with you or point out a navigational feature that can be quite helpful if you're kind of getting lost and um, ending up on an article and not sure where you are this breadcrumb trail can be quite helpful at the top here so this tells you where you are in the structure of the newspaper so at the moment we're on this article it's on page four of the 1st of April 1919 for the Dominion and all of those are links so I can kind of zoom out if you like um, from the structure so if I can go to page four then I can go back to the, the issue itself. So let's say something does take our fancy it's relevant we go into a birth notice for example and here we are okay this is great I want to do something with this so what are your options here? So you've got the option to, if you don't want to save the image itself or print it or anything, probably the simplest thing is to go into this research info tab here and you get a permanent link to the item and the bibliographic details. You can just copy that and paste that into whatever system you're using for your family history research. If you do want a copy of it in some way, this is where I'll just flip this back to the image. Uh, you've got print and copy options at each level of the newspaper. So we can print it here. If I right click on the image, I can uh, just adjust that, there you go. Save the image to your device, or you can also copy it and again, paste it into whatever system you prefer to use. Um, what I would just say is, uh, oh, let me just demonstrate that. So if we go up again, using this breadcrumb trail, I go up to page one, you can see you've got options to save, options to print and again you can copy 
or, or print an entire um, issue as well. Just one thing to point out, if you're using things just for personal use, generally speaking, you'll be fine. Um, but if you are wanting to use the item, just be aware of this using this item section next to any article you're looking at. This will just let you know if there is any copyright that applies. It's also useful, it'll tell you sometimes that it doesn't, definitely doesn't apply. And you're just a bit sure about what you can and can't do with that material. Okay, so that um, is sort of in a nutshell how you kind of browse around the site. And it's, it's very similar for the other collections. Each does have its own idiosyncrasies, but that should give you a general orientation if you're not familiar um, with browsing around in Papers Past. So let's go into searching. So searching is probably what you're going to be doing most of the time if you're looking for family history within Papers Past. We don't always have the luxury of having exact dates or exact regions um, or publications where we expect to find something. So what I'm going to do is take an admittedly pretty contrived example, but it will hopefully give you um, some tips on searching and strategies that are available within Papers Past, and also some of the filters that are available on the website to help you narrow down your results. So, uh, get my mouse working, here we go. Uh, imagine, if you will, a gentleman called William Hughes. And now this William Hughes, uh, according to family law, was a, an accomplished bass player, an upright bass player, and played in bands around the Taranaki region somewhere around the turn of the 20th century. So if you've got a name that's uh, uncommon, you're in luck and you're going to get less results in a more targeted set. But with something like Hughes, of course, we enter that and we get 909,000 results, which is just exhausting just looking at that. So definitely don't have time to go through all of those tonight. So we need some kind of angle um, on this person's life. So in our case, we've got this musicianship angle, so we can add something like bass. But in your cases, you're gonna, you might have something like the person's profession, it might be a street that they lived on, it could be um, a community group they were involved in. Um, I think even in our results, we can see somebody was playing cricket, so maybe it's a sport. So you just want some kind of hook to get into to start narrowing things down. And if we just try that simple search for starters, you can see we narrow things down considerably to about 6,000 there. Okay, so um, let's scroll down and have a look at the results. I'll just talk about what's happening here if you're not so familiar with this interface. So when we do a search, we'll get a list of articles. Um, you'll see a link back to the article, which newspaper it came from, and the date. And there's different ways of arranging that information. It defaults to a best match, so kind of a computer algorithm's best idea of, of what's relevant in terms of the keywords you've entered. But um, there are other ways of arranging it, and a popular way of arranging is by date. You've got that option there. I digress. But let's have a look at the, uh, the results here. So this is a common thing you'll get when you're searching for terms that or names that are homonyms, so they have some other meaning. So you get all these confounding results from red herrings coming through. So names like field or day or hammer, that kind of thing. So you need some way of disambiguating. Um, one approach is to just add more information into your search. Another is uh, removing those red herrings. So here's a technique. We can type in a minus sign here. And if I type in straight, because it was bass straight, that was the odd result I was getting there. That's going to remove any articles that reference straight in there. So just be a little bit careful of this technique, because it is a bit of a blunt instrument. So for example, if this uh, Mr. Hughes was an overachiever, and not only was a great musician, but also was an enthusiastic swimmer that swam across the Cook Strait, and that this was newsworthy, we'd miss out on that whole side of his um, career. So you, just, you probably want to experiment with this as much as anything. And if we do a, run a search again, we'll see that result has, has disappeared. So that's working well. Okay, so other filters we can start applying is, uh, again, we can limit down to the, the Māori publications with uh, the search here. Um, we can also apply dates. So let's say um, we take 20 years either side of the turn of the century. So you can type in the dates, or I'm just going to use a slider here to take it to 1880, mm -hmm. and then 1920. Okay, and I can run that. We, 
and I'll close there and we can see that search is stuck. And I'm now going to look at titles or regions. So you can limit right down to an individual title or a particular region or a bunch of different regions. At the moment, it's searching across all of the titles, all of the regions. I'm going to untick that. And knowing that he was operating in Taranaki, I will click on that. Okay, so let's run that search. So we've got this Hughes base, no straight. We've got a date range and we've got some regions or a region. I'll leave content um, for a little bit. Let's have a look at that. Okay, so now we're down to 172 results. Now you might notice I haven't put in any other name information. I've just left that out for now just to point out something here. So if we look at this article here, this first result, it's not particularly relevant to this William Hughes, but just notice this convention coming up. Miss F. Hughes, Mr. N. Smith, maybe, uh, Mr. J.B. Pope. So if I'd typed in William Hughes, I wouldn't be getting this result. So just a tip to, um, and I'm sure you, many of you may be thinking this when you are doing your research, just pay attention to the source material that you're looking at. As you discover it and become more familiar with it, you'll notice these little journalistic conventions or writing conventions. And really, when you're doing a search, you're trying to, to match you know, the, the kind of quirks of the source material. So this is just something to park in the back of your mind. Okay, I might want to try just, a, just an initial, and I may want to try a full name. So for example, if this person was appearing in court, you might get the full name. But in other instances, like this one, and often in sports results, I've noticed you'll just get a, a first initial. So what we could do is mirror that um, convention, type in W Hughes. I'm going to put it in quotes if I can. Uh, well, there we go, finally. And what that will do is just force the search in that, uh, the words in that particular order, so I'm not getting them out of place. So you can swap names in and out, or you can also run variations of the name in parallel. So if I go, I can go W Hughes uh, or capital O-R, and William Hughes. Again, I'll put it in quotes just to force it to do that. And I'll need to put that in brackets just so it knows to do this first. What that's going to do is going to search for W Hughes or William Hughes and base, but not straight. So you can kind of swap names and swap name variations in and out, or you can put them all together like this um, just to catch these different variations. So if I search for that now, I'm down to 12 results. So possibly I've tightened the net too much and you do want to play around with these filters, um, but we'll hopefully have caught something. And because I've prepared one earlier, I can guarantee you have caught something. So if we scroll down, we're getting T Hughes, a Walter W Hughes, a T Hughes again. Uh, now this is interesting, RAS seeds. This is a mistranscription in the search searchable text. It's thinking this is base, and we'll talk about uh, searchable se uh, text correction soon. Um, and we, oh, this is classic, isn't it? I'm not actually finding my person. <laughs> Let's go into the second set of results. Something changed since I last looked at it. Oh, there we go, thank God for that. Uh, w Hughes, that double bass solo. Here we go. So if I click through into this, I get this article about a West Coast band contest. Now, one helpful feature here is your search terms will be highlighted. You can turn these off, but if you've got a very long article, you can, it can be useful just to scroll down first and check where your keywords are turned up just to make sure it is worth reading. So in this case, we've got a double bass solo by a w, w Hughes from Harvard. Hughes was such a good player, he played in such a good style that Judge awarded him the full number of marks. Now, you'll notice that he was the only player, so maybe it wasn't that hard to <laughs> win a prize in this case. Um, but that's another thing. Now, I've noticed that double bass didn't come up in my search, even though I searched for bass. And that, I assume, is because you've got double dash bass. It's treating that as a single word, so it hasn't picked up bass. So I might want to feed that double dash bass back into my search. Um, what I will do is investigate a bit more of this West Coast band contest, just to show you another um, search filter that you can use. Now, I'm going to use this back to search results link. This is useful if you don't want to clear your search. Um, so I go back and it's kept my search that I've, I've used previously. What I'm going to do is look for this West Coast band contest.
this. And I'm going to choose a particular type of content. So in newspapers, you can differentiate between articles, advertisements, and illustrations. So I'm going to untick the other two and choose advertisement. Now, there's only seven results there, so I could just not be lazy and read all of them. But imagine that you had more results than that. Um, and this and advertisements can yield different types of information than perhaps um, regular articles. So if I'm searching the West Coast Band Contest, and I go in there, I've got an advertisement there, and I get different information. So how much it cost, for example, where it was, that may not be apparent in, in, in another article. I also get some information there that businesses were considering the hours of closing business during the event. So it gives you a sense of maybe how important the event was to the community at the time. Okay, so that is a bit of a whirlwind tour of using Papers Past and some search techniques. Now, there's a lot of uh, more sophisticated searching and um, clunky search operators and, and so on that you can use. Um, and I'd point you towards the help pages in, in here, and there's a lot of different examples that go beyond what I've shown tonight. Um, and also, if you hit a brick wall, metaphorically speaking, I hope, you can contact us, at the, and this is at the bottom of every Papers Past page. If you go in there, you can use our Ask a Librarian serv service, and you can also contact me directly here, Papers Past website contact, about using Papers Past more generally. Okay, so that's, uh, hopefully there may have been one or two things that you picked up from that, but what I'd like to do to close is to share a feature that we have in development, which is Papers Past text correction. Uh, so I'll just go back to the presentation. And here we go, text correction. So I uh, use a text correction more specifically, what is it? So it's easily the most requested feature that we get year on year uh, for Papers Past. And it's, it's, design, well, this, it's designed to solve or at least help solve um, the problem of OCR or optical character recognition mistranscriptions. Now that's a mouthful, what does that mean? Okay, so when, if you look at uh, the, on the left of the screen, this image of an article that you're reading, you can just make it out with the naked eye if you were able to get up close enough to it. But that's not what your computer is reading. So when, when we digitize newspapers, you get a bunch of images that are not machine readable. So we have to run them through this process that will make sense of those images, turn it into searchable text. And this can be more or less successful and you do get some disasters. So for example, if you look at this um, article there, it's pretty blurry. And, and this is where the problems come in with the source material being of variable quality. And you can see it's had quite a hard time um, transcribing that text. And what that means is that essentially some words become unsearchable. So the request is that people could go in, they might notice an error and then they can uh, edit it themselves. Okay, so earlier this year, we spent several months um, with a co-design group. So that was uh, a designer, a developer, National Library staff, including myself, and some volunteers from the New Zealand Society of Gene Genealogists, um, some of whom, all of whom are here tonight. <laughs> uh, so uh, that was a very useful process. So designing both with the National Library and people that are ultimately going to be using it. And I'll just show you uh, what we have come up with so far. Okay. So this is our development site, and here is an article I've prepared earlier. So you can see it's not unreadable, but you've got a bit of ink bleed um, onto the page. And this is on our development site, so this is what the feature would look like, at least where we've got to with it. So you get, I might just blow that up a little bit. A bit more readable. Okay, so you get a little prompt that tells you when you go on an article that the searchable text was automatically generated and may contain some errors. And there's also a prompt that you can correct any errors that you spot. So uh, before this tab here was just um, text, but now you see a prompt for view correctable text. Now you do need to create a Papers Past account or will need to create a Papers Past account, much like you do for National Library for other services. But once you've done that, you have the option to correct text. So if I go into the text here, you can see it's had a, again, had a very hard time making sense of it. So I can choose, at this point, you can see I can correct this text. Okay, and I'm already logged in, hooray. So you get this editing screen. And what you get is the text alongside the image. So if I can pick a line, it's a rather terrible one here. 
Oh, what I can do is start typing that in. I'll just choose a quicker one. Uh, there we go, for sale. You'll see when I start entering that text, I get a little green border around it. So as I go down, that'll happen for any line I touch. So you can kind of keep track of what you've been doing. Now, in the event that I was very keen and had a lot of time, I could go through the whole lot and then mark it as completely correct down the bottom here. But I'll consider my work done here, considering uh, I've got to make some time for Kelly. Um, and I can save my changes. Changes are saved, it tells me so, and then I can just exit out. Okay, so now if I just, um, if I go back in, oh, actually, no, I'll do it another way. So now you get a, a thank you message for improving the accuracy of this article text. And then you can see your corrections along with other corrections that other people have made. So if I just open that up, you'll see the one I've just done. And you have the state on the left, which is how it was originally and what I've edited. And then on the right and blue is what I've changed it to. In each case, you'll have a list of what other people have been working on too. And then you can click through to those, those articles with a link there. Now, what we also have is a leaderboard. So if you're very enthusiastic, you might get into the top all-time contributors or perhaps the top contributors in the last 30 days. And uh, if you click on your account name next to your entry, this will give you a list of your own corrections. So this can be useful. For example, maybe you just made a couple of corrections like I just did, but you want to go back and do a little bit more later. You can just click back through that takes you back to that article. So that's um, just a brief overview of the changes. Uh, of course, the $64,000 question is, when is, is this going live? Um, well, I can tell you where it's at now. So we have um, designed this minimum viable product, as we call it, um, so this basic set of features. It's undergoing an internal review, so the organization's just happy with what we've produced. We need to do a little bit of web design around the uh, home page just to build in, you know, help into the help and about content pages, information about text correction, how to do it, guidelines, that kind of thing. And we're sort of taking the opportunity to just review some of that information and maybe bring in some suggestions we've had um, over the years from people like advance um, mention of upcoming content releases, things like that. So that's the work we're doing now, um, but it's on its way. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that little sneak preview and some of those tips, and I think that's probably enough for me, and I'll pass it over to Kelly. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Kelly Dixaho. I am the online engagement manager and I work mostly on digital New Zealand. Thank you for coming along today in person and via Zoom. Um, I hope you enjoy diving into Digital NZ, um, starting with this photo, a, um, a lantern slide image of the Devereux family outside their house on High Street in Lower Hutt, and it's from 1887. This talk will be quite practical, um, how to search Digital NZ, and then we're going to take a quick look at how to make family, well, how to make stories, but particularly family history stories. And I'll leave time at the end for questions for both Jason and I. So Digital NZ, it is a website run by the National Library, and it's primarily a search uh, website. And we aim to help make the New Zealand digital content easier to find, share, and use. When I say digital content, it's quite diverse. So we have photographs, we have newspapers, we have video, audio, uh, we have research papers, and every, all the different kinds of content. We pull together more than 30 million digital items altogether, and they are from more than 200 different content partners. 
So a content partner is what we call the organisation whose content we harvest, we bring into Digital New Zealand, and they range from small museums of sort of 50 items uh, to large museums like Auckland Museum, the National Library. Uh, we also harvest uh, sort of content from tertiary organisations and more. So you can see here that with a search for coach, we're bringing in content from uh, organisations such as the New Zealand Fashion Museum, Upper Hutt City Library and South Canterbury Museum. So quite diverse organisations all in one place. And an important point to note is that Digital New Zealand is not a repository. We don't hold items. Instead, we point out to the items where they sit on their own websites or their own, their own digital collections. And we do that um, if, you, if you want to get to the original source, uh, you can click on the view original item button, the red, red button on the right hand side. And it takes you through to the item on the content partner in this, uh, in this case, the National Library. And you might get some extra information here um, and including in the gray box, you can see there's some information here about how to credit or caption this information, or if you want to use this photograph. So I mentioned that we frequently bring in new content partners. So this is one of our more recent content partners, the Lincoln and Districts Historical Society. And um, this is quite an interesting item. It's a receipt for school fees uh, for Canterbury College for the girls' high school. And they are for uh, Ethel Howe. She was born in 1878, and her school fees cost four pounds and four shillings per term. Uh, another fairly recent content partner is the Timaru District Libraries. And they have a lot of sort of photos and images and newspaper clippings from the area, from the Timaru region, including this great photo of Pauline Hamilton and Pauline Hart uh, repairing some library books. Uh, for those of us who live in Te Whanganui Atara, there is the Wellington City Archives uh, collection is fantastic. We've recently brought that on. Uh, this photo is of uh, some staff from tram car drivers, and they are outside the Thorndon tram barn. Um, and this photo was taken in 1914. We also have recently brought in a collection from Auckland Libraries. It's their YouTube uh, collection. And their collection features their uh, recorded talks, the Heritage Lunchtime Talks. So you can go along and see them in person, but they are recorded and they're just fascinating to have a look at. This one, this screenshot is from a talk by uh, Andre Tabor, and it shows the Min, uh, the Nan King restaurant at 51 Grays Avenue. And the language, English language sign in the window is possibly the first um, example evidence of chop suey being sold in New Zealand. So if you have any ancestry, Chinese ancestry, this is a really interesting talk about the emergence of that scene in Auckland. And finally, this is a uh, photograph from Archives New Zealand. We we brought on one of their collections, it was actually last year, but it's more than 30,000 photos from the National Publicity Studio. So that's a government photography studio. And those photographers traveled around New Zealand and the Pacific, photographing um, all sorts of people and places for promotional reasons. Um, and the fact that we bring in such diverse content all into one place is one of the one of the great reasons that um, Digital New Zealand is so useful. So following up from Jason, I'd just like to take a look at how papers past in Digital New Zealand can sort of support each other and complement each other in family history research. So I'm started with a search for the name of Ethel Fenton. Um, you can see that here she is in 1910. She's living on the terrace and in the Dominion, 20th of January, 1910, she has made the paper for uh, achieving a scholarship. So I, ha I had to check what a scholarship was. Um, it's a junior Wellington education scholarship. 
and it was an exam that was introduced in the early 20th century and passing it meant that you were eligible for attempt to attend secondary school uh, or for a free place at secondary school and some students like Ethel also received a scholarship so the scholarship prize she would have received was 10 pounds. So my next paper's past search for Ethel Fenton turns up in 1913. Uh, once again, she's won an education scholarship. Uh, this time it's a senior school scholarship. Uh, and you can see she is attending Girls College, that's Wellington Girls College. And she's living in Baden, Baden Road, Kilburnie. I'm not sure if that road is still there, but um, there's a little bit more information about what she's up to in 1913. Uh, she turns up again in 1917. This time she's passing her exams at Victoria College. Um, she received a, uh, sorry, she, she passed her advanced senior first class in pure mathematics. She was quite smart. Um, she also won the Sir George Gray scholarship alongside um, a fellow student, Mr. J.E. Brodie. And in 1920, she has uh, achieved her Master of Science in Mathematics. And it talks about a little bit more. She gets a, a paragraph where it explains that she was educated at Victoria College and at the Girls College in Wellington. And that she um, it lists all the scholarships she has achieved over the years. But quite interestingly, she was appointed the demonstrator and assistant to the professor of physics. So. Um, I'm assuming that this is at Victoria College or Victoria University. So then I swapped over to Digital New Zealand to see what we could find out about Ethel uh, from, um, from searching Digital New Zealand. So just a little aside, we do have some of papers passed in Digital New Zealand. So most of the newspapers available in Digital New Zealand are have been brought across from papers past, but we don't have them all. We hope to one day, but it's such a large resource uh, that we haven't been able to bring them all across yet. So it really is worth searching both websites. So one of the first things I find of Ethel is actually a photograph of her, which is lovely. Uh, it's a staff photo of the science faculty and it's come from the Victoria University of Wellington their heritage collection um, and there she is in the front row and I've enlarged her so you can have a good look. Um, uh, this is the caption and the caption confirms that it is uh, Fenton Ethel with physics uh, in brackets. I'm not sure why only the woman had their specialties noted uh, but clearly something about the time. Also in 1919 on Digital New Zealand, I find um, an article from the Spike. So the Spike is like the student newspaper from Victoria University. And it lists here uh, that she received her, her master's in science. So it backs up what we found out in papers past. She received her in 1919, um, Sorry, this is actually 1921. In 1921, it notes that she received um, her second class honours in electricity and magnetism. So that lines up with what we know about her, um, her knowledge of physics and her role in physics. And in 1923, the same magazine, The Spike, notes that she gets married. So she marries a fellow student, presumably. He also has a Master of Science, W.G. Harwood. After thing, this, things get pretty quiet for Ethel Harwood or Fenton on Digital New Zealand. So I was really thrilled to go back to Papers Past to see what happened to Ethel Fenton. Um, and by 1944, she was, uh, she, was the senior, she was the science mistress at Rotorua High School. Uh, her husband, Mr. W.G. Harwood, was the headmaster. And she made the newspaper because there were some public protests about the dissection of two cats by senior biology students. So she lived quite an interesting life. And I think that the fact that uh, we're able to, to sort of use papers past in digital New Zealand 
to back up the two different, you know, to have two sources of evidence about her life is really useful. Right, so now we will look at searching Digital New Zealand. Uh, so to search Digital New Zealand, um, you are literally with more than 30 million items, you're searching for a needle in the haystack. We've got a bit of a theme here today, <laughs> Jason and I. Uh, we both had fun looking for images for this talk. So, oh good, this is much better resolution than I had in my last talk. You can see that um, I have searched, put in a search for railway station, and you can see that at the top um, in the search box, and it's come up with more than a million search results with the um, metadata railway station. So there are some ways that we can narrow down our search results. The first row uh, underneath the search box um, has a whole lot of format types. So if you are looking for a particular format, uh, you can click on the different tabs and filter by different formats. So for example, um, you can see here there are images, audio, video, stories, and if you click on more, you can see newspapers, articles, archives, manuscripts, websites, and more. And this is what a newspaper result normally looks like. So if you click on um, the newspaper, it takes you through to the sort of article that um, Jason was talking about in papers past. The second um, row of tabs uh, enables you to filter uh, by content partner. So if you were visiting a museum and you saw uh, a photo that you thought was really useful, but you didn't take a photograph it or record and you can't quite remember what it was, this is a really good way of filtering down your search results. Um, or if you wanna go, if you're planning a visit, if you're traveling to a different part of the country and you just want to see what a particular museum or library has in their collection, this is a really quick and useful thing to do before you go. You can also filter by collection. So some content partners have more than one collection. Uh, in this case, Auckland Museum has their general collection. They have a Flickr collection, so a photo collection that they have put into Flickr. They have a YouTube collection, and they also have the Cenotaph database, of course, that is almost as big as their general collection these days. You can filter by usage. So we have five uh, usage statements. They are all rights reserved, modify, share, unknown, and use commercially. So these statements are based on the usage statements that we receive from content partners. That, so they make those judgments and those decisions about how an item can be used. And we just bring those across. So we do recommend going to the content partner, especially if you want to use an image commercially, actually going and getting in touch with them and checking whether something can be used, and if so, how it should be credited. I mean, of course, the perfect image may be all rights reserved, but that doesn't mean you can't use it. Uh, for example, this photo of Motet is all rights reserved, but if you just get in touch with them, um, they may just want you to credit it a certain way or get permission from someone. It's always worth asking. Copyright can be really complex, so we have help pages as well, like Papers Past. This is just a quick screenshot of what the Digital New Zealand uh, copyright help page looks like. So just go and explore, it's in our top navigation. The final filter is you can filter by decade. So you can select one or more decade to sort of narrow your time period. Another helpful way to search is to use uh, some of the, the search tips and tricks that Digital New Zealand supports. So once again, if you're really interested in searching in this way, if you just visit the help page, but I'll just give you one example of, of what we call a fuzzy, well not me, what librarians call a fuzzy search. And I'll use the, uh, the search term Wanganui as an example. So if you, um, so to do a fuzzy search, you add the tilde key to the end of your word and the tilde key is the top left one. It looks like that on your keyboard. And it looks for words that are similar to the word that you've typed in. So 
often with family names, they might drop an E. One of my family names is Boyt, and sometimes it doesn't have the E, and sometimes it does. So if you add the tilde key, it will pick up both versions of that name. So with Wanganui, which sometimes has an H over history and some, sometimes doesn't, you can see here that there's 56,900 without the tilde. But when I add the tilde, it jumps up to 73,000 73, images. So that's a lot of um, things you may have missed if you didn't include the um, tilde. You can, of course, search for Wanganui with and Wanganui without, but it's just much faster to use this type of search. So one of the great things about Digital New Zealand is that you can find some really interesting um, pieces of diverse content, but you might need to try different ways of searching. Um, there are so many unidentified people in Digital New Zealand or in collections across the country. Uh, there are 23,000 images with the metadata unknown woman alone. Um, so try searching for the school that your ancestor attended. You can see here, this is um, a photograph, a class photo of um, Prima, two, Prima 3 and 4 of Littleton West School, and it's from 1914. So these 13 girls are not named, but if you can recognize what your ancestors look like, you might find them in a school photograph. There are also a lot of photos of tertiary um, providers as well. So this is a photo of Wellington Polytech, some architectural students from 1962. Uh, if you know where your ancestors worked, it's always worth putting in the company or the business name of who they worked for. Um, this fantastic photo is of four unidentified staff, again, from the Clanderboy Cooperative Dairy Company. And this photograph was taken in 1960 and it's part of the Massey University Library collection. You can also try searching the name of the street where your ancestors lived, because there's a lot of house plans and photographs of houses in Digital New Zealand. This um, is some plans of a house from Hackthorn Road. Uh, the house was for Mr. Parsonson, and these plans were drawn in 1919, and presumably the house is in Christchurch because these plans are from the Christchurch City Libraries collection. And if you're lucky, dancing has been prompt in requests for pictures to be taken. Fast right along in front of the camera, please, and give others a chance to be shot. These scenes were taken in a well-known town which put on a most successful ball recently in aid of unemployment funds. All of them know there's a camera in the ballroom and each secretly hopes to be spotted by some big shot in the film industry as having a moving, I mean a movie face. As the mayor said when declaring the ball open, let joy be unconfirmed. Force me round again, Willie. So that was... Um a movie themed ball in Dalclutha in 1933. So if you're lucky enough to spot someone you know in some old film, that's just, uh, we, want, we want to hear about that. <laughs> um, we, I mentioned that there are a lot of uh, items where the people are not named. So if you do come across anyone that you recognize that you can add a name to a photograph as you're browsing, or if you notice there's a mistake, sometimes slides of of places are, are sort of scanned and back to front. Um, you can let us know. So there's two ways you can do this. We have a, a Facebook, it's a Facebook comment tool at the bottom of each item page. And you can see here that this photograph of three um, telephone office assistants from 1961, um, someone has got in touch to say that one of the women in the photograph is Maureen Zelda Waller. And she worked in telephone exchanges most of her life, and she passed away in 2017 in Parapapa So we were able to get in touch with Palmerston North City Library because this photo is in their collection, and they can add this information to their database for future um, researchers. If you don't have a Facebook account, you can get in touch with us. Um, you can email. Most of us work in this building, which is looking quite glam here. Um, but you can email us at info at digitalnz.org and we'll pass on any information to the content partner. And of course, you can contact the, the, contact 
the content partner directly. So just go to their contact us page and let us know, let them know if you've got more information you can add. Right, so the second part of my presentation, I'm going to talk about storytelling very quickly. <laughs> um, so you can make uh, you can make stories in digital New Zealand. So we have over 8,000 different stories that have been created by, uh, by teachers, by students, by people who are interested in things, and also by content partners and academic organizations. And they range, they're, they're huge, varied topics. So you don't need to sign up to search Digital New Zealand, but you do need to sign up to get an account to create a story. And to do that, you add your name, a username, so you can be anonymous if you like. You can then you add an email address and password. You will receive an email. It's quite standard where you need to confirm your account, so it's not spam. Um, you do need to do that. And then you can go ahead and start to create stories in Digital New Zealand. So I'm just um, going to quickly show you a story that I started creating about the Ferry family. They're quite a well-known family, so there is um, there is quite a lot of information on Digital New Zealand. And what I want to do is I want to start to add items to my story. So you can see that on the search results page, there is a little button I can click called Add to Story. Or if I click through uh, to the item record page, I Add to Story is also there on the right as well. So once you click on that button, you choose the story that you would like to add to. So there's a list there of my stories. So I just look for the one called the Fairy Family of Dunedin. And this is what my story is going to start to look like. So you can see the image I've added on the bottom left. And also at the top, there is some information, including the title. So to take a closer look, this is where um, we fill in some fields that help make your story more findable to others. So you can add subjects, you can add a description, and then you can also manage and change your access. So Digital New Zealand staff, we moderate these stories every day just to make sure that um, they're not spam. And um, so once we've moderated it, you can change the access. And we have three different settings. So Public means that it's findable by anyone who searches Ferry, for example, on Digital New Zealand. Hidden means that people have to have the URL to see it. So it's quite useful for sharing things with your friends and family. And private means you need to be logged in. So while you're working on your story, we recommend that you set, set the access to private. You can add text to your story. You can see I've added some text. In 1892, 16-year-old Gabrielle Ferry immigrated from the village of Bichare. And you can see in that red uh, text, that's my source for this information, the New Zealand Fashion Museum. Um, and that's actually a link through to the website or to the article where I found out this information. So you add text, the ability to add text is there's a button underneath each line of photos, and it works in a really similar way to, um, to Google Docs or to Microsoft Word. You can choose styles and bullets and different heading levels. So you can move your um, items around in a story. It's a bit tricky, so you need to play around with it, but you can drag and drop to get them in the order that makes sense to you. And you can also add caption information. And this is a really good example of a caption. Uh, what you can see below the line in each three photos is what the Alexander Turnbull Library has added to the item. But the author of the story has added dates of birth and death and also some other extra information that she has found in her research. So it adds a lot of value to the item when you sort of start to put um, research information as well. You can also upload your image. Now, I'm just going to skip forward a little bit because it's nearly time for me to finish. But you can upload your own image. And you enter a title and a description. You choose your copyright, uh, your usage statement. 
you agree to the terms of use, and I'm sorry, it's a bit quick. Um, and you can see here that the photo that I've added of my cat in the garden is sitting next to items from Howick Historical Village and the University of Otago and the Alexander Turnbull Library. So you can add your own items and sit them along items that you find in other collections. You can also print your stories. And this is what they look like when you want to print them. You can also save them as a PDF, of course. And I'll just quickly show you a few stories. This is one that Auckland Library's Heritage Collections has put together. Um, and they put that together for New Zealand Music Month with some music related items from their collection. One of our most popular stories is the life cycle of monarch butterflies. So I think it's used within classrooms a lot. And also women working in World War II. And one here on Dame Fina Cooper. And just to go ahead, we have Sarah's story, a uh, random O'Callaghan photo. So you don't need to add text. You can just put together um, different things and items that you find in Digital New Zealand. You can just put them all together on one place. This is a very similar one about the Rutherford family. And you can see here that this researcher has uploaded some of her own images and she's actually added some information into the caption. In this family history story, uh, the author has had no photos of their family in 1840. So they've added uh, posters and advertisements of the type that their ancestors would have seen before they immigrated to New Zealand. So I'm just going to end there. Um, thank you very much. And I'm sorry I haven't left very much time for questions. I'm not sure if there are any on via Zoom. On the other side. Yeah. Do we have any questions, please? Here we are. Coming through. Thank you. Um, you were you were showing um us how you could edit um the, the, the text that was sort of automatically read from newspapers. We had some squiggles and things and you could put in your own version of it, mm -hmm. correct it. Um we I presume at some point that's um, viewed by a person to say, yes, that makes sense, tick, it becomes correct. So or we're not going to do institutional moderation, but uh, it's going to be community moder moderated. Yeah, so if you notice that something's not quite right, you can correct it and vice versa. Like if, it's quite interesting to note because, you know, obviously that seems to be a concern when people can go in and change anything. But certainly with Trove and other organisations that have run um, user text correction, people are remarkably disciplined. We may be an exception, but yeah, we'll, we'll be certainly starting with community moderation because uh, the volumes that you get and with people's partic participation, generally speaking, are much more than we would have time to go through individually. Yeah. Who actually owns the stories? If you put your own story up there, do you do you own it still, or does the organisation own it? Or for Digital what? New Zealand, the the stories are Creative Commons, but it, they're your stories. You can delete them whenever you like. All right. What about indexing them? Is there any facility to index the names in these stories? Uh, they do come up in a search result. So they will come up in, if you search Digital New Zealand. I'm not sure what you mean by but indexing. If, if, you, if you want an index at the end of your story. Oh, that... if you want to add references? Yes. Yeah, you can add. You just type the text in or copy and paste the text in.
just a quick question about uh, papers passed or oh, incidentally before I ask the question uh, you talked about Emily and uh, her qualifications at Victoria University she married Bill Harwood who happened to be my mother's teacher for over high school <laughs> <That's> a story <laughs> another question about um, papers passed do you have a list of newspapers that you would like to get hold of which you don't have I mean, sometimes you have a list of a certain paper and it sort of implies that there are missing editions along the way. The reason I ask is that recently I came across a couple of old weekly news newspapers, uh, the old pink uh, shaded things there. And I wondered, well, do I chuck them out or do you have copies or just what should I do with them? Yeah, well, we don't have a, a list so far. I mean, we have pretty good access to the, the holdings of the National Library, but you are right, there there are gaps um, sometimes. And certainly if you notice a gap in that collection, you happen to have a lead, then yeah, let us know. In terms of what you do with it, um, I would advise going to the donations page at uh, National Library. And what you can do is just say what you've got and is the National Library interested? And then the curators can um, get back to you and say whether or not they're interested or not. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> I've got one online question for you. Um, will we have to use Realme to log into Papers Past, or will there be an option to use Realme or create our own account? Is there someone else who would like to deliver the bad news? <laughs> yes, we will have to use Realme. Thank you, everyone, and thank you to everyone on Zoom. Good night. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to find out more information about the New Zealand Society of Genealogists or our many branches around the country, please see our website www.genealogy.org.nz.